I recently just finished reading Flint Taylor's book, The Torture Machine, which starts with the death of Fred Hampton in 1969, but then tracks the Chicago police torture cases, which started with Andrew Wilson, a death row prisoner who was tortured by officers, including the infamous Area 2 Chicago police commander, John Burge. The Wilson case occurred in 1982, after he was forced to confess to that murder of two police officers in Chicago. And to give you an idea of just how long this dragged on, 2015 was when a lot of this was finally resolved. So highly honored to have Flint Taylor on the show. Welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you. So I want to start by laying uh, a little groundwork here. So uh, just to lay out the scope, you were in your early 20s when Fred Hampton died in 1969 and just finishing law school at that point. Um, and that itself was a lengthy case, uh, which uh, went on uh, for a number of years. And then the Wilson case happens, and uh, those went from the 80s to 2015. Um, at what point did you realize this was going to become kind of your life work? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, it's hard to say. And as a young um, law student uh, immersed in the late 60s in terms of the, the fight against the war in Vietnam, uh, the, the Black Panthers uh, and the Young Lords and other organizations were so powerful and uh, uh, making so much uh, revolutionary noise during that period of time. Uh, and it, we, you got kind of drawn in and drawn along by events. And of course, as you mentioned, uh, a, a very, very significant event in my life and in the life of the lawyers and, 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 and law students that I was working with at that time at the People's Law Office was the uh, murder or assassination of Fred Hampton, uh, the chairman of the Black Panther Party in Chicago in 1969 on December 4th. And he was our client, as were many other Black Panthers. And so I was called to the apartment where Fred Hampton was murdered uh, because the police left it open. And we stayed there for 10 days collecting evidence. And so during that 10 days, I think uh, on the, on the, on the in the wake of the actual murder of Fred Hampton was something that uh, I certainly didn't think at that time, well, 50, Two years later, I'd be discussing all the work that I had done with my colleagues and others and the movement uh, in these cases. But on the other hand, there was an understanding uh, that this was something that we would be fighting for some time. And, and, and that's kind of went along from uh, event to event and, and legal fight and political fight to political fight to where we are today. And it's really interesting because, you know, and I was born in 72. So, you know, I'm almost 50. This happened just before I was born. So I, I'm not like a young, young guy. Uh, you know, everything's relative, but uh, just putting that all into perspective. And I knew a little bit about the Fred Hampton case. Um, and I came across uh, a little bit more when I was reading on uh, J. Edgar Hoover and COINTELPRO and, and some of that stuff. And that got me interested in looking at this, but I, I kind of wanted to, uh, you know, wrap our listeners' minds around the fact that we're not talking about a case like Laquan McDonald, which you also talked about in your book. You know, that's kind of a more typical police shooting case. There's an incident that happened uh, clearly, the police overreacted. Uh, they they lie about it. It uh, they they try to cover it up. Uh, a video comes out, and then kind of the shit hits the fan from there. But Brenda Hampton's really different from that. I mean, th you called it an assassination, but that's really you know the accurate way to uh, describe this, right? Yes. Well. Um... As I talk about in the first rather lengthy chapter of my book, it was a 13-year struggle to uncover what 
1983 appeared to be uh, the, the, the whole truth about the assassination. Uh, it started out with the police and the uh, state's attorney of Cook County. role was kept secret by the FBI, its counterintelligence program, a highly uh, a secret, uh, illegal and unconstitutional program, which was designed to neutralize and destroy uh, black militant leaders uh, from Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad, uh, H. H. Rapp Brown, Stokely Carmichael, and then of course, as the Panthers rose to prominence in the late 60s, the Black Panther Party and Fred Hampton. So that over uh, many years of, uh, of litigation that I was involved in with my partners at the People's Law Office, particularly Jeff Haas, uh, we were able to uncover that COINTELPRO, that counterintelligence program, that uh, project from J. Edgar Hoover and Washington was in fact behind the raid that an FBI informant provocateur had uh, drawn a floor plan of the apartment showing where Fred Hampton uh, would be sleeping. Uh, they passed that on to the state's attorney and the police, uh, and they encouraged to do the raid and then claimed it as a victory, uh, claimed it as a success after Fred and Mark were murdered. So uh, then I think it's fair to say, as you have, uh, that it was an assassination because an assassination uh, is, 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 goes beyond a murder. It's a political event and it's a political killing. And that's what the assassination of this uh, young, very powerful uh, and dynamic uh, leader of the, of the Black Panthers here in Chicago, that's in fact what it was all about. It was to neutralize the Panthers. And when, and when the law enforcement, the CIA and the FBI uses those terms, they mean everything from the kinds of things they did to Dr. King to, to murder and assassination. And um, that's, uh, that's what uh, 13 years, uh, I went from a young law student to a uh, quite experienced young lawyer through those 13 years of litigation. And I, I just want to frame this so that people understand this is not crazy talk. Um, this is actually proven. Like uh, the, the church committee in Congress uh, was able to disclose a lot of these documents directly from the FBI. So this is not like some crazy conspiracy theory that, oh, the government's trying to assassinate black leaders. Now, this actually happened. Well, yes, and J. Edgar Hoover had a pension, uh, almost an obsession for having the agents and his uh, lieutenants and, uh, in the field and also uh, in Washington to write everything down and to circulate everything. So when, we talk, when I talked about the neutralization program, the counterintelligence program, uh, the terminology neutralize and ultimately the terminology destroy comes out of those FBI documents. The counterintelligence program was quite secret, 
but uh, some, some activists broke into an FBI office in 1971, and lo and behold, they stumbled upon these documents that said COINTELPRO, counterintelligence on them. And some of those documents said the very things that I just mentioned about uh, neutralizing and disrupting black nationalist organizations, preventing the rise of messiahs, and they named the people that I just named. And then in all of that litigation that we did, uh, not voluntarily, but through much uh, uh, fighting in court, uh, the government ultimately produced 200 volumes of FBI files relevant to the Panthers and Fred Hampton in Chicago. And so when I talk about that floor plan, that was a document we got. And ultimately, we got documents uh, that showed that the informant provocateur, William O'Neill, uh, was given a bonus, uh, $300, which I guess translates out to about $2,000 in today's money, uh, 30 pieces of silver, as it were, uh, Judas is 30 pieces of silver, uh, to set up the raid. And after the fact, he was rewarded with the bonus because in the FBI's own words, the raid was such a success. Uh, the, the floor plan was of tremendous value and the police could not have gotten that information from any other source. So it's far from saying, uh, well, we didn't really mean for the, uh, you know, for Fred Hampton to be killed. We really didn't mean for Mark Clark to be killed. Uh, the FBI, both in Washington and in Chicago, was patting themselves on the back and rewarding the actors. Um, and I'll get a little bit later, if you'd like, to some recent revelations, 51 years later, that, that further uh, ex expose the, the depth of, of the conspiracy. And yes, unlike the kinds of crazy conspiracies, the QAnon conspiracies we see today that come out of thin air, or the paranoia of, of some uh, very uh, psychologically, uh, uh, shall we say, deranged individuals, uh, the conspiracies of the government and the police against the black nationalist and the black revolutionary movements in particular, and the left in general, particularly in the 60s and 70s, was a known fact. Not, it was known because people who were in that movement understood what was happening. And then later it became proven by the very documents that the FBI tried to secret, but ultimately through our case and through the investigation, such as the church committee that you mentioned, the Senate uh, Select Committee on Intelligence in the wake of Watergate uncovered, it proved it. And that's the difference we see in the kind of uh, harebrained conspiracies of the right and the conspiracies that have been shown to be true through actual evidence uh, with regard to uh, the Panthers and other uh, left organizations. And you had mentioned uh, the Media Pennsylvania break-in, which uh, really uh, a bunch of, there's a great book that just came out in the last few yeah. years, finally, uh, where, where some of the uh, people that were involved in that uh, finally talked to uh, a, a writer and uh, put everything down that they did. But, uh, you know, we might not have ever found out uh, some of this stuff uh, without them. Uh, you know, when, when you read some of this stuff, I mean, what was your thought? Was, was your thought like, no way this can't be real? Or was your thought like, yeah, I knew this was gonna be there? Well, um, we like to talk about the fact that on December 4th, as I mentioned, we went to the apartment and we were taking um, evidence. The Panthers uh, were, were very politically astute. Uh, and uh, in their uh, sorrow and rage, they conducted uh, uh, tours of the apartment. So while, while, while we were taking evidence, the Panthers were showing the world and thousands of people from Chicago, particularly from the uh, African-American community, uh, the bullet holes uh, and what really happened there. But Bobby Rush stood in front of that apartment on December 4th and told the world that he laid this murder at the foot of J. Who Edgar, 
which is the way he described J. Edgar Hoover. Now, Bobby Rush, of course, was uh, the um, Huey Newton to uh, Fred Hampton's Bobby Seal in the Black Panthers. He was the, Rush was the Minister of Defense and, and Fred was the chairman of the Illinois Black Panther Party. So yes, we believed it. There were so much going on, so much repression. Um, but until O'Neill was revealed, we didn't have the evidence. We were fighting this case in court. And then because in another case, O'Neill was, was uh, outed as an informant, uh, that gave us uh, the lead that we needed to pursue, well, uh, what role did O'Neill have in the Black Panther murders? And remarkably, O'Neill was our client because he was a Black Panther, we thought. And all of a sudden, one of our clients uh, turned out to be the key informant provocateur uh, in the setup of the, of the murder of Fred Hampton. So we went from there and, and fought and got the, the floor plan and the other documentation over several years uh, that showed uh, the FBI conspiracy. So yes, we believed it as a political reality that was unfolding uh, on the streets uh, of this country. Uh, with Nixon and John Mitchell and all, all of the people that were in power, uh, it was clear that they had a war against the left and particularly against the Black liberation struggle. But the documentation, thanks to media, the media break-in, thanks to some FOIAs that were done by uh, 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 reporters, and thanks to the, the, the Senate committee and to our lawsuit, uh, all of this information that proved the theories uh, and, and beliefs uh, that, that we all had uh, came uh, to fruition. And, you know, just to kind of close this out, you know, one thing to keep in mind, uh, you mentioned Bobby Rush. Bobby Rush became a very well-respected and longtime congressman. So that's the caliber of individual we're talking about with Fred a Hampton you know, who knows what he could have become, uh, you know, had he been given a chance uh, to mature. Definitely, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the uh, former uh, Panthers get together every year with, and we, we're honored to get together with them on December 4th. And there, you know, there's a judge, there's a doctor, there's uh, teachers, there's, they're all, the, the Panthers were the best and brightest of, of uh, our, our communities uh, back in the 60s and 70s. And the ones who survived went on and have gone on uh, to be very remarkable people, not surprisingly. I would mention as we close out our discussion on the Hampton case, that there, is, uh, uh, there were several very important documentaries that, that came out, uh, the murder of Fred Hampton that came out right after his murder by Mike Gray, and then there was a piece, uh, Eyes on the Prize 2, uh, which came out in 1990 that kind of wrapped up all of this evidence, uh, and it was called The Nation of Laws. And this very month, there's a Holly, Hollywood uh, version of the, of the Fred Hampton-O'Neill relationship called um, Judas and the Black Messiah. And it's a Coogler film made by Ryan Coogler, who made the, the Black Panther movie of, of great fame. Uh, I'm, I'm anxious to see what, what it, uh, how it depicts things, but I think uh, the actors, are, uh, they have some very good actors and they had a good screenwriter uh, and we'll have to see, but we know from the title, Judas and the Black Messiah, that it has captured, uh, at least to some very real degree, the FBI's role in uh, the assassination of a quote, black messiah uh, in Fred Hampton. So kind of moving on now to the torture case. Um, and I'm gonna frame this kind of similar to how I framed the Fred Hampton case. So, you know, I've personally, you know, been investigating over the last 15 years, cases of police misconduct, officer involved shootings, things like that. What we're talking about in the torture cases is not simply police brutality, but we're talking about something that's 
uh, flat out out of Abu Ghraib or perhaps even Dachau uh, in terms of what took place? Yes, um, torture um, can mean many things to many people. And there's a definition of the, of the UN uh, that, about torture in terms of coercion of, of, of people to give confessions. Uh, but when we use the, the term and we used it in the torture machine, uh, which is the title of my book, uh, and the torture machine, as you uh, probably gleaned uh, from the, reading it, is, it, has two meanings. One is the torture machine, which was uh, is uh, depicted on the cover of the book, which is a box with a generator, an electric generator in it, um, hand crank generator with wires attached to that generator uh, and clips on the wires uh, by which you could turn the crank and send electric current through those wires into a human being through the clips. And the torture uh, that was done by John Burge, who came back from Vietnam, was on a POW camp as a military police officer or sergeant, actually, uh, in Vietnam, where they were torturing people with an electric shock. So he brought this technique back to Chicago, to the South Side, uh, to the predominantly African-American community where he was a detective. And he started to, to get confessions pretty regularly for, in very serious cases. And it turns out uh, that he was using this box to electric shock people, particularly people like Andrew Wilson and his brother Jackie, uh, who were uh, captured for, for killing two white police officers in 1982. Uh, but they were using other torture techniques that you wouldn't connect with police in this country necessarily. In uh, those included dry, su dry submarino, which uh, was putting bags over the heads of, of people they were questioning, cutting off their air supply, uh, making them think that they were going to suffocate. It's called dry submarino because in other countries, sometimes they would dunk a person's head in water and hold their head in water. And that was submarino. But this was dry submarino. And they, they, the detectives that worked with Burge uh, used this tactic. And they used mock executions as well, putting a gun in someone's mouth, putting it to their head and pulling the trigger. Uh, making them think there was a shell in the, in, the, in the gun or in the shotgun that they put to their head. Uh, and those were some of the techniques along with uh, beatings, uh, with, with uh, rubber hoses, uh, with, with uh, baseball bats and, and nightsticks, all with the, uh, um, ven not veneer, but with the connected with uh, racial epithets, uh, attack on the genitals, uh, just the kinds of things that definitely fit torture as it's thought about internationally. Uh, and that's the kind of torture that happened as a systematic program under John Burge for 20 years in the city of Chicago. And, you know, you described uh, what happened in the book in such vivid detail. I mean, you know, I spent half the time just cringing, as you might imagine, uh, from the description. But I mean, the thing that really struck me was there was almost no way for these guys to win uh, because they would just keep up the torture until they broke, right? I, I mean, none of these guys were able to hold out forever. No. Um, there was a, Interestingly, there were a couple of cases. The Melvin Jones case, they were not able to get him to confess to, a, uh, to some murders. Uh, they charged him with a gun case instead, and he testified that he'd been tortured. Uh, they, the judge didn't uh, uh, accept that testimony because the judges back in the 70s and the 80s in, in, in the criminal courts in Chicago, and unfortunately hasn't changed all that much, uh, are pre predominantly white uh, former prosecutors some of whom were in fact as prosecutors connected to the torture scandal. So you come up in, you know, and you testify in court saying my confession was tortured from me in front of a judge uh, and uh, who's perhaps, if not 
um, uh, a former uh, prosecutor in torture cases, certainly sympathetic to prosecutors and police who have been involved in getting these confessions. Uh, and you have Burge and these other uh, decorated detectives coming in and saying, oh, that didn't happen. He, he voluntarily gave this confession. He's just making up the story to try to beat his case. Uh, and so in all of these cases, these judges would deny the motions to suppress. Uh, the confessions would come into the trials. Uh, the men would be convicted and they'd be sent to either death row or to life sentences. Uh, and um, that's what started to come out uh, in the 80s when I got involved uh, with my partners uh, at the People's Law Office uh, into uh, fighting Andrew Wilson's civil case. Uh, and um, at that point, the, it was thought that Andrew Wilson's civil case was perhaps a one-off. You know, uh, this was the, the cops being outraged because two of their fellow uh, officers had been, been killed. Uh, and so therefore they tortured the two men that they uh, had eyewitnesses to say were involved. But it turns out, thanks to an anonymous police source, uh, the deep badge, as we call them, uh, kind of in honor of uh, deep throat in the Watergate case, um, contacted me and my partners during uh, the civil trial of Andrew Wilson in 1989 and said, look, this is a systematic issue. This isn't just a, a one-off case and gave us leads uh, to take us not only to other victims of police torture, but also to show that it went up the ladder. Burge at this point had gone from a detective to a commander of police. The um, pro head prosecutor, uh, Richard Daly, Richard M. Daly, the son of Richard J. Daly, had gone on to be the mayor of the city of Chicago. Uh, so over the next 20, 30 years, we were able to uncover evidence uh, along with the movement and other lawyers that showed that there was at least 125 African-American uh, victims of Burge and his men uh, at the uh, police areas where they worked. Uh, and they, the tactics used were the same tactics that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and because of this evidence coming out, uh, many men were ultimately exonerated, taken off of death row, brought civil suits, but some of them still remain uh, in the penitentiary. Uh, reparations were obtained in 2015 from the city of Chicago that included not only uh, monetary uh, compensation for, for, for the torture survivors who hadn't collected any money, uh, but also such things as teaching the torture scandal in the Chicago public schools, uh, a full-throated apology from the mayor, uh, a center on the south side of Chicago that uh, was uh, focused on treating uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and other uh, psychological uh, and emotional issues that the men and their families had, uh, and a memorial uh, in honor of the, of the uh, torture survivors. But that scandal still continues. Uh, I just finished a trial uh, in the Jackie Wilson case, Jackie Wilson being Andrew Wilson's brother, um, and we were able to show after all these years that his confession was uh, part of this pattern and practice of torture. He got a new trial and we did a pandemic trial. We did a trial actually in court during the pandemic in masks um, and we were able uh, to expose uh, the, the prosecutorial misconduct and the case was ultimately thrown out of court and Jackie Wilson was uh, certified as innocent. Uh, so that happened uh, just a few months ago. So the, the, the scandal hasn't ended and the fight uh, for justice, uh, if you can call it that after all these years and decades in the police torture cases continues in the city of Chicago. Yeah, and, and that's a sad thing is uh, just how immense the scope is. There's really no such thing as justice at this point. It's just kind of mitigating uh, bad outcomes. Um, I, I, you know, one of the things that, that strikes me and I think people need to kind of understand. So, you know, not only was this 
a torture uh, where there's a physical torment that people are exposed to. But if they, uh, a lot of these people were falsely convicted based on these false confessions. So in addition to however long the torture was and what and however long the physical manifestation, and in some cases that was severe and prolonged, um, some of these people ended up in prison for decades as the result of this. Well, I think almost all of them did. Uh, and um, some of them, I mean, we'll never know, uh, perhaps, um, because DNA was, you know, these weren't the kinds of cases that DNA would definitively show uh, that they didn't commit the crime. Uh, so the issue in these cases is torture. And the issue in these cases is that no one should go to prison based on a tortured confession. The confessions might be false. The confessions might be true. They might be partially true. It really doesn't matter. Number one, the torture itself is reprehensible and is in violation not only of the Constitution, but of all international law. But number two, it is per se a wrongful conviction if someone is convicted in part or in full based on a, a confession that was tortured from him so or her. And so uh, in any event, each and every man who has any kind of uh, colorable case of torture should get a new trial. Uh, and the prosecutor should be put to its proof if it has any uh, without using tainted and tortured confessions. Uh, and that's been a part of the, the fight here. Uh, and many of these men have are yet to get a new trial. Jackie Wilson did get a new trial ultimately th after 36 years in the penitentiary. And in that trial, he was ultimately not only exonerated, but was found to be innocent. So yes, uh, obviously some of the men were, quote, were, 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 were actually innocent, but all of them were convicted based on tortured confessions. So they were wrongfully convicted. And so that's really the, the, the enormity of the crime. And the enormity of the crime is the cover up as well. Of course, the second half of the meaning of the torture machine is the Chicago political machine, the Democratic machine, the mayor uh, daily, uh, the prosecutor who was daily before him, uh, the police superintendents, uh, all of whom know about this, who covered it up who didn't prosecute the real criminals, that being Burge and his uh, crew of what they called internally ass kickers, Burge's ass kickers, uh, just a thoroughly racist operation, a white supremacist uh, operation uh, that went on not only from 1980s when, when, when the Wilson case happened, but it, went, it started in 1972, uh, back uh, when Burge first became a detective. Uh, and so it went from 1972 to 1991 uh, when Burge was ultimately uh, suspended and fired based on the evidence that we and others had uncovered. Uh, and of course, the scandal and the cover up continues to this very day because none other than our uh, purportedly progressive uh, mayor has decided uh, to fight the torture cases in court when civil cases are brought. Even Daly and even Rahm Emanuel, who succeeded Daly, didn't have the chutzpah to go into court and fight against men who brought lawsuits after they'd been exonerated on the basis of torture. Lo and behold, Mayor Lightfoot, who on the one side of her mouth talks about how terrible the Burge torture scandal is, on the other side of her mouth, sends her lawyers into federal court to fight against the evidence that there was a pattern and practice of torture. And she got her come up, up in, uh, early last year. She fought a case uh, in federal court claiming uh, that the Burge and his men didn't torture and that the, the man involved was not uh, wrongfully convicted. And lo and behold, the jury brought back a $5 million verdict for the man. Uh, so the city, uh, but but we'll see. There's other cases in the pipeline, and my guess is she's going to fight them. Uh, so it's a never-ending battle 
around uh, wrongful convictions and police torture and cover up. Uh, the city and the county of Cook and the state has spent over $175 million uh, in the torture scandal. Uh, a good chunk of that is to pay lawyers to defend these cases. Private silk stocking lawyers get paid uh, high hourly rates to defend Burge, who's now deceased, by the way, uh, and the other torturers and the city itself. Um, so I, I want to uh, talk. Uh, you mentioned the judges. I was, uh, you know, and obviously I read uh, Jeff's book on the Hampton case, and so he he detailed the conduct of Judge Perry. Um, you detailed that as well as uh, Judge Duffy in the Jack in in the Wilson case. Um, I mean, I, I've been covering this stuff a long time. Not anything compared to the length. Uh, uh, of you, but I've you know covered hundreds of uh, of uh, criminal hearings and watched you know probably dozens of judges. I've never seen anything like how much they put their thumb on the scale. I I mean it was unbelievable. In fact, it was so unbelievable. Uh, after I read uh, Jeff's account in the Hampton case, I actually pulled up uh, some of the pleadings and and the appellate court ruling just to make sure he wasn't blowing smoke and he, he, he wasn't. I mean, how'd you keep your cool? <laughs> well, uh, we did sometimes and we didn't sometimes. And we ended up uh, in the Hampton case, as you know, uh, being sent to the federal lockup uh, for short stays for contempt. Uh, that, that was uh, reversed by the appellate decision. That, that appellate decision in Hampton is just a remarkable landmark decision. I don't think I I I, com I commend lawyers particularly to read it because you very seldom see a, a a set of judges talking about a conspiracy to murder and cover up as part of a program uh, to uh, to wipe out a vibrant black organization, i.e. the Panthers, uh, and it's a seventy-page opinion, which is after an eighteen-month trial in front of that Judge Perry, uh, the. Uh, he he take, took the case away from the jury and threw the case out after 18 months of very powerful conspiracy evidence, and we had to appeal, and we did. And and uh, it, the luck of the draw, we got two very good judges, and the third judge on the three judge panel was a former FBI agent. So suffice it to say that the decision was two to one in our favor. Uh, a remarkable decision. Uh, re and reversed our contempts, uh, as well as finding that conspiracy, finding we put on strong evidence of conspiracy, and also that the government had had acted uh, with complete misconduct in covering up evidence. Uh, of course, the FBI, former FBI judge, uh, wanted uh, our, our contempts to be upheld, and the conspiracy, he, he didn't want to find it, uh, that there was evidence of it. But the, the judges, uh, judges are so instrumental. And I think it's interesting uh, and, and, and disturbing that on this, this recent attack on democracy, uh, small d, uh, that, that's going on, uh, that the courts are the least democratic. Uh, either, either the judges are elected in a way that really that, that there's no there's, there's real no, no knowledge in the electorate of who's good and who's bad, or they're appointed for life. Uh, and more and more, uh, when they're uh, this anti-democratic movement is turning to the courts where Trump has appointed the judges, uh, by uh, many of the judges. But going back to the judges we dealt with and continue to deal with. If you get one of these uh, former state's attorneys or you get one of these Alabama racist judges who moved to Chicago like Perry, or you get one of those racist Irish judges from my home neck of the woods, Massachusetts, uh, in Judge Duff, um, you get uh, the kinds of, uh, of outrageous rulings, particularly when you have lawyers such as us who don't, aren't satisfied with the judge's rulings and letting them lie, but 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 confront the judges with the evidence that you have and the truth of what you're fighting for. 
And that really, really aggravates uh, these racist judges. And that's what happened in, in, with Perry, uh, who would not accept and could not accept that his buddies at the FBI would in fact have done this. And if they had, he wanted to cover it up. And similarly with Duff, who referred to our black uh, um, illiterate client, Andrew Wilson, as the scum of the earth. Uh, so that gives me an attitude about uh, the uh, 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 to see the attitude of those judges. But when we came to the Jackie Wilson case in 2015, when he was granted a new hearing, lo and behold, we ended up in another in, in front of another judge uh, who was a carbon copy of Duff and Perry in Judge Ford. But we were lucky enough. Uh, to get rid of him because he was a former prosecutor involved in a torture case. And it was sent to a very courageous African-American judge, one of the few on the bench. And because it went to a very courageous African-American judge who was independent of all the uh, torture machine, uh, democratic machine, uh, prosecutorial um, um, uh, dirt that, 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 that permeates the criminal courts in, in Cook County, he did the right thing. He found there was torture. He found that Jackie's confession should be suppressed. And ultimately, uh, he found that Jackie was innocent. So it, if you do get uh, lucky enough to get a, a judge that's not connected, uh, who's not racist, uh, and who looks at the evidence uh, in a fair and impartial light, like we did uh, in the appeal of the Hampton case, and like we did uh, in Jackie Wilson's retrial, then you have a shot at, at justice. Uh, but otherwise, you're fighting, you're fighting uh, tooth and nail uh, to bring out truth, to change the narrative, and ultimately to hopefully uh, get the kind of justice that, that, that your clients deserve. No, I, I just don't understand other than, you know, the corruption aspect of it. But, you know, Judge Duff just wanted to limit, uh, you know, the uh, the evidence coming in to the, uh, to the point where he really cut the, the, the meat out of the case. I mean, this was a pattern and practice case. And, and the idea that you wouldn't want to introduce evidence uh, to show a pattern and practice was is just beyond me. Right, and but you have to understand that he, Duff mixed uh, this, this attitude, this racist attitude, this pro-police and, 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 and anti-African-American attitude uh, with a certain amount of insanity. He wasn't, he didn't have all his marbles either, you know? Uh, and by the time uh, we got to Judge Perry in the Hampton case, uh, he was like, and and uh, I say this advisedly uh, because I'm I'm headed towards the same age bracket that he was in, but you know he was like, uh, he was on the the far edges of 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 competency uh, mentally. He used to put on dark glasses on the bench, uh, and we we knew for a fact that he was snoozing up there during some of the testimony, but. You know, the, the, the attitudes that these judges had uh, and have really come out in political cases. Uh, you know, they're able to just kind of do their uh, systemically uh, mass incarceration enabling, uh, 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 you know, uh, judging on a day-to-day -day basis without much conflict because the, the the prosecutors do it, the PDs, uh, uh, although there's some very good ones, including uh, my daughter, uh, they, you know, they're, they're, they're overwhelmed. And, and so the system goes along because they're, except in, 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 in infrequent occasions, the system is not challenged. It's not challenged at the base. It's not challenged at the at the root of white supremacy and racism and mass, mass incarceration. And when some kind of half crazy lawyers like us come along and actually call out what's going on in a political case where your client is already uh, disfavored, uh, to be very kind uh, in terminology, who uh, who's extremely unpopular, uh, then you get the kind of fireworks. Uh, that happened in, in, in the Hampton case and, and in the 
the uh, torture case, uh, Wilson case, and ultimately in Jackie's case before, Jackie Wilson's case before we uh, thankfully got from the worst judge uh, that we could have had to perhaps the best judge we could have had. So, um, you know, one of the interesting uh, things that came out of all of this, and I, you know, it's funny because I didn't even realize the extent of uh, all the torture stuff. I knew about the wrongful convictions and, uh, of course, uh, Governor Ryan's ending the death penalty uh, in Illinois as the result of all these wrongful convictions. But I didn't realize the connection between that and the torture in, in, until I, I read your book. And, and then it all kind of really came together. I mean, um, how much of a role did these torture cases play in the governor's decision? Uh, I think a large role. Um, the, there were hearings, um, parole type hearings uh, before he made his decision. Uh, and four or five of the men who were on death row uh, were very clearly tortured by Burge and his men. And those cases were presented to Ryan uh, as part of the reason that there should be clemency uh, with regard to all of the men in death row. But what Ryan did was he pardoned on the basis of innocence four men who had been tortured by Burge. And he made that a, a, a separate determination. Uh, then he moved on to the other 160 men and women on death row, uh, who some of whom had been tortured, but uh, most of whom had not, uh, and uh, he what they what the press call, termed as cleared death row. He granted clemency to the rest of the people on death row and commuted their sentences to life in prison. So the 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 torture, I think, really really uh, had a major impact on on Governor Ryan because he could see in those cases that not only was the death penalty inhumane, regardless of whether you committed a crime, but there were men on death row that not only uh, um, didn't commit the crime, number one, but number two had been tortured. So that was, uh, that was very significant. Uh, and those four men who were pardoned uh, we ended up representing two of them in civil the civil suits that came afterwards. Uh, and uh, that was the vehicle that we were able to uncover more evidence of police torture uh, in the um, early 2000s after uh, uh, Governor Ryan pardoned uh, the four men and uh, cleared death row to, and, and commuted the sentences. What's really interesting, I think, to me is that, you know, when Ryan did all this, he got severely criticized. Uh, a lot of people kind of downplayed it. Oh, you know, he's trying to save himself because he's facing all this corruption uh, stuff. But this was really not that. This was a guy who was really rising to the occasion, who saw something desperately wrong. And, and, and this was a real heartfelt, emotional decision for him, was it not? Yes, he was a, a downstate from Kankakee, Republican, conservative. Uh, when he first came into office in 1998 or 1999, his, one of his first decisions was to um, okay the execution of the last man who was executed uh, in Illinois. And that was in, I believe, 1999. Um, and then another uh, death penalty case came um, on his desk, uh, Anthony Porter, uh, who was not only a borderline in terms of his uh, intellectual capacity, uh, but there were real questions about guilt or innocence uh, because someone else had ultimately uh, confessed to the crime. And so at that point, Ryan um, had a moratorium on the death penalty. And, and we can't really underestimate the power of the movements here the, the, in Chicago over decades that, um, to, to, against the death penalty. Uh, there was a, a death row 10, 10 of the uh, torture uh, men who were on death row banded together and people on the streets supported 
uh, their uh, their cases, and 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 they were put in front of Ryan, and four of those were the men that were ultimately pardoned by Ryan. But there was a process with Ryan, an education of Ryan, that yes, he he had a real uh, humane side to him, uh, and uh, that all of the struggle that went on to bring these these issues to him as as a moral and political and legal question. Uh, that was just four or five years of, of that. Uh, and he then, I think, really, truly in his heart became against the death penalty. And um, on his way out the door, he did what we just talked about in terms of the pardons and the commutations. And it certainly didn't help his cause. Yes, he, you know, every politician almost in Illinois can be uh, scrutinized for, for some kind of uh, corruption or another, and he had some in his background. But I assume that uh, probably he was more uh, focused on because of what he did with the death penalty rather than less, and he ended up going to jail for, 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 for years on the corruption case. Uh, but he also became a very outspoken a uh, critic of the death penalty and went around the world speaking against the death penalty before he was incarcerated on the, on the corruption charges. So um, he uh, definitely uh, had a conversion, a conversion based on, on his conscience uh, and a, a conversion based on uh, what the movement and, and, and uh, the truth about the cases uh, were shown to him over the years. We're just about out of time, but um, on Andrew Wilson, uh, is it your sense that he was tortured into confessing to something that he actually did do? Or uh, how, how did you uh, conclude with that one? Well, with Andrew, his case, uh, he first got the death penalty. There was an eyewitness uh, who was across the street uh, who identified Andrew as the shooter uh, of the two officers. And Jackie uh, was almost an innocent bystander or was an innocent bystander. He had driven the car that had gotten stopped on a routine uh, traffic offense. And his brother hopped out uh, and uh, ultimately, according to the eyewitness, shot the two officers and killed them. They then uh, left the scene. Uh, so um, Jackie was rounded up along with Andrew. Uh, Andrew, they both were convicted of the double murder. Uh, Andrew got the death penalty, but he got a retrial because of his tortured confession. Uh, they threw the confession out. He had a second trial. Uh, he was convicted of the murders again based on the eyewitness testimony. Uh, and he, uh, the, the jury that was to determine the death penalty and the second time, uh, one juror held out. So Andrew got double life sentence rather than the death penalty. And he died in the penitentiary in 2007. So there was definitely evidence that Andrew committed the crimes. On the other hand, Jackie, uh, the, uh, the evidence was that he was driving the car when it was stopped by the police. He stood by uh, in shock when his brother shot the two police officers. Uh, and then he drove away with his brother. Um, but he spent 36 years in the penitentiary before he was able to get a new hearing on his torture. And that, as I talked about before, uh, he ultimately was shown to be innocent. So uh, of course, the, so I guess you would say that uh, the courts and the juries have found Andrew to be guilty of the crime, whereas the courts have now found Jackie, his brother, to be innocent of the crimes. Um, so I guess that's the best answer I could, could give on that. I do want to say before we close uh, about reparations. Reparations uh, was, was a remarkable um, accomplishment by the, an intergenerational and uh, interracial movement here in the city. Uh, and it is a, uh, an example uh, that other uh, cities across the country have taken up in one form or another uh, in terms of when there are civil cases of importance, 
that um, not only is should there be a settlement, money settlement, but there should be an apology. There should be some kind of memorial. There should be some kind of education around the events. And this is, has been adopted uh, in several places from New Orleans uh, to Little Rock in, in a, cases, uh, case that I was involved in. And in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, 40 years later, uh, the Greensboro uh, City Council has finally admitted that the police were involved in the uh, massacre uh, by the Klan and the Nazis of the five anti-Klan demonstrators. And uh, so they've not only apologized, but they've set uh, up uh, scholarships in the name of the five victims of the Klan and Nazis. Uh, so reparations is something that is a demand that can be and should be made uh, in cases where uh, there is extreme uh, police violence. Uh, and uh, this seems to be something that, that the movement uh, in various cities has taken up and continues to take up. All right, well, I know we went a little longer, but I, I couldn't cut us short. Uh, I hope you don't mind. Um, and thank you so much for your time. It, and, and really, thank you so much for your your half a century of work on this stuff. I mean, I mean, this is just mind blowing. Uh, this is America, and I, I know you've mentioned that a, a few times in your book. But you know, this is stuff you read about in Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo and and third world countries, and this was happening in Chicago. I mean, definitely, uh, you're you're right. Uh, it's great to have uh, been able to, to talk with you. Thanks a lot. Right. Take care. And